Oh, Jessica, it makes me so happy to be able to see you today for the first time in about more than a year, I think. I think so. Yeah, it's nice to be here. It's really fun to catch up. Yeah, and for people watching the video, my name is Gretchen Wegner. I am the creator of the Anti-Boring Approach to Powerful Studying, and I created a training program for people to become academic coaches. And Jessica, you were maybe not the first, but pretty close to one of the first cohorts to go through my training. How long ago was that? 2015. 2015. Yeah, you were the second yeah. and second cohort to go through. And now it is 2022 and you are choosing to leave your coaching business and move to some different work, which we will find out about in a little bit. And I just wanted to have a moment to celebrate you and your journey and your experience in academic coaching uh, to be able to see you one last time <laughs> selfishly uh, before we shift into friendship. <laughs> But then also I've been getting more and more requests from uh, people out there who are considering becoming academic coaches to hear stories from other people about what uh, having a coaching business is like. So we're kind of doing multiple things with this video at the same time. Great. So first of all, I think we'll just do a, an, a linear narrative. So back in 2015, can you remind yourself and me and tell the listeners why did you even reach out to me in the first place to start your business? So we had moved from England to Massachusetts. Currently we're in California. So we were in Massachusetts at the time. My kids went into a school system that was very different from the one they had been in in England and a very competitive public junior high slash high school. And so we were trying to fill academic gaps in terms of you know, Spanish vocabulary, math differences, and I came across your podcast that you did with Megan, and I was listening quite a bit to that. And then you just happened to mention, I'm doing this training. First time you mentioned it, or the first time I heard about it, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then the second time it came across the podcast, I thought, wait, I could do that. So I was so deep into trying to solve these problems with my own kids that I thought, well, maybe this would be helpful for myself. And I didn't necessarily think in terms of like growing into a coaching business, but I thought the framework would be very helpful. And then by the time I had talked to you about setting up my own business in coaching, I was like, wait, I think I could do this professionally. So, and it worked quite well because we were kind of in the country. It made a lot of sense because commuting into Boston was a huge impediment for me getting a job at that time because I had a lot of little kids. And it just made sense. I could do it in the evenings. I could do it when they were at school and it would be flexible. So that was sort of how I came into coaching. And then I took your training and I just loved it. So it just grew from there. And I just find it fascinating that you took the training and then you stayed in the community for the entire duration of being an academic coach. And so maybe not in this moment, because we still need to hear what it was like to build your business from scratch. But what I want to get to as well is why is it like, what were you getting from the community that made you so willing to, to stay <laughs> with us um, for, because that's how, how many years have you been with us now and can't even do the math? Almost seven. Almost yeah. seven years. Yeah. So well, we'll hold that idea though, because what was it? You, so you're one of the people who sometimes there are teachers or former teachers who come in to start the training. You are solidly a parent right. <laughs> who had to learn the tools to support their kids and then thought, oh, I can do this. You also are somebody who just loves learning too. Right, I right. Would say. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, but that means you didn't have a big educational network. You were kind of starting from scratch when you began our program, other than the schools that your kids went to, right? Right, exactly. So what, what did you learn early on for me that just helped you get up and running? And how fast did you get up and running? Do you remember? It was very quick. <clears throat> uh, I think I got my first student before we'd even finished the training. Mm -hmm. Because we were in such a competitive area, there was a lot of need. And so that was a huge boost to starting my business. You know, there were just classes and classes I knew because my kids had gone through them in previous years that 
they were bottlenecks in terms of getting into the honors program or getting into the next you know, class that a student really wanted to take in order to set them up for high school. So those were very nice ways of getting students in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, this is what we can do. This is how I can help. And because I had helped my own kids, I was able to say like, look, I even have these materials from the class. So okay. that helped a okay. lot too. Like, okay. so that was a huge boost. Okay. I think from the training, what really helped was just get out there and do it. So it's very much a lean startup approach, but applied to coaching. Mm -hmm. um, people aren't yeah. familiar with that. So in Silicon Valley or in startup world, like lean startups are kind of these new ways of thinking about biz building a business where you go out, you try something, you get feedback from the customers, you iterate, you progress, um, and you try to do it fast and you try to do it at a low cost so that I wasn't throwing, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars at advertising. I really kept my overhead quite low. Um, the only thousands of dollars that you threw was to me to right. hold the container for the training, right? <laughs> right. But I think in my first year, if I'm remembering from my taxes correctly, I had spent the money to pay for you, but I had made that back all except for like a couple hundred dollars by the end of the first year. Mm -hmm. And I have literally kept my prices fairly low because I want people to be able to do that. <laughs> so right. I am glad that that worked for you to be able to repay yourself for the investment you made in me. Right. And then yeah. that was the only year that I had any loss, like a couple hundred dollar loss. Mm -hmm. Then after that, you know, I was positive every year mm -hmm. and that just kept increasing. Yeah. And again, I would say that because when you jumped into the circle of licensed coaches, that's $1,200 investment per year. And so how wonderful that you were making that right. and, 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 and weren't, you know, just felt easily like you were able to fill your business from that. Right. How much would you say that you have been filling your client load from referrals from me compared to referrals through your own networks that you've developed? In the beginning, it was more a referral network that came from you. Mm -hmm. So there's probably 50, 50, maybe a bit more on your side at the beginning. And now it's probably like 90% my own and then 10%. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, I'll get some, a, like a trickle in from you. Mm -hmm. Um, so really it snowballed, right. But a lot of those clients that I got initially from you, then they became, referral. they became your regular yeah. clients. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, if I were to trace it back, it's probably still, you know, <laughs> 50, 50, but it's a couple of generations like removed from right. the initial referral. Right. Right. And that also is what I intend. Of course, I don't, I, I love being able to provide referrals to the coaches who come through my program, but I also, I'm, I'm a coach through and through. So I want you to have the skills, the marketing skills that you need. And it sounds like you have been able to develop, to develop that. Like if my referral stream dropped off, you would be just fine in your business at this right. point. It yeah. Sounds like. yeah, definitely. Okay. So let's talk what, what does a full client load look like for you? Like how many clients do you see just, and walk us through like when you like what your schedule is through the mm -hmm. day, like anything that will help somebody considering becoming a coach, think about whether they can follow the model that you've created. So my advice would be decide when you want to work mm -hmm. and then put that into practice. So that was probably the mistake I made early on. I was just so happy to get clients that I kind of, and I didn't have as many, so I was more flexible around them. So I would say early on, it kind of took up more of my day, Yeah. but I also kind of needed to be more flexible. Yeah. That has really changed over, you know, once I started to get past maybe five or six students, I really did have to be more careful with my time. Mm. Currently, I have 15 students, which is a nice like midline for me. I have been up to 20 students, and I felt like that was too much in terms of meeting everyone's emotional needs, communicating with parents effectively, um, trying to 
do all the things that we do as coaches. 15 is kind of my happy spot in terms of income and flexibility around my time. So right now what I do is I have the blocks that I work and they're not complete blocks, right? Like there's breaks in between, but I do admin stuff in between, or I, you know, get up and have a snack in between. So I don't like to have a video in between. (laughs) Right. Videos in between. So for the most part, I coach from 1 p.m. Pacific to 6 p.m. Pacific. Wow. And it's not four days a week. Yeah, four days a week. Uh Four days. And that is not a huge block. Some days, the most popular blocks are always Pacific time from like four to six. Right. So those are generally blocked at blocked out. Um, but it's been, you know, you have a lot of flexibility as a coach because it is your own business. And I have found that if I set, these are my hours and I stick to them, everybody is happier. I'm happier. My kids are happier. Mm -hmm. Um, we eat better, right. If I'm not trying to put all, you know, just go with the ebbs and flows of Mm -hmm. kind of the chaos that comes with the job, you know, settings, stronger boundaries. I wish I had done that earlier, but live and learn. It also was really helpful when I moved from the East coast to the West coast, because East coast kids just get out earlier, you know, whereas, um, it's harder. I do have two college students on Tuesday and Thursday for half an hour each, but that's pretty, um, easy to manage. Mm -hmm. And that was a decision I made, right? Like, and you mean in the evening, in the, in the later evening time? No, in the mornings on oh, Tuesday and Thursday, because they're on the East coast. I see. And so we just do an hour block okay. back to back. Um, I see. That was a decision we made. They just couldn't do the afternoon with their class yeah. schedule. And I had had them for quite a while. So I yeah, was willing to be flexible, but I would say, you know, know your schedule and said that ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Also know when you're going to take vacation and set that ahead of time. Right. And ahead of time, meaning, I mean, what I do, I'd be curious what you do. What I do is at the beginning of the school year, I just look at my client load. I look at when their spring breaks are. Obviously, Thanksgiving is always the same week. And I just go through and just block out. Like, I'm going to be gone here. I'm going to be gone here. I'm going to choose this week as my spring break. I'm going to end the school year at this point, whether or not even I do. These days I do. I'll end. There were some years I was like, I'm going to end end of May. Even if I have some clients that go a couple of weeks into June, we will just finish coaching end of May, uh, which was hard for me to choose to do that at first because I was like, ah, they need me. They need me. But right. I was prioritizing the schedule that I needed. So what do you do? That's what I do. And, and I even have, I just Googled like school calendar template mm. and I make a little school calendar for myself ah. and then I send it out to parents. It looks very official. So it's really, oh my God, nice. Would you be willing to share that so that I can put it in the Google Drive oh, yeah. for all totally. the folks yeah. who rock your biz? That would be huh? so fun to have that as an example. <laughs> I love it. Your very own school calendar. <laughs> and it just is, and Liz Hammond and I are the ones who, we came up with this one summer and it has worked incredibly well because I'm like, please see the calendar, right? Like if I'm sending a reminder email, like, please remember I have spring break this week, please see the calendar. Um, you know, it's just a lot easier. And I have students at the beginning of the year, put my breaks on their calendar. Like Jessica is gone mm-hmm. this week. Like if they don't overlap, especially spring break, cause nobody's spring breaks overlap mm-hmm. that you, you have to set it. And here's a funny story. One year I did not take a spring break, but I went to England with my daughter for her spring break. And I tried coaching from England. <laughs> This is a total disaster. Do not ever do that. Um, Given the time change, like my jet lag, our travel schedule, it was such a mess. And I vowed never to do that again. And I haven't. So don't do that. Just learn from my mistakes. (laughs) And I do remember several conversations that you and I have had over the years. One in particular, I was walking around a body of water and it was the end of the school year or something. And you were just so stressed out and burned out. And I was like, Gretchen, I know you told me from the very beginning to block out my vacation days and to only decide when I want to work and not schedule otherwise. And I should have followed your instruction, but I guess I just needed to find it out myself. (laughs) No, I had to learn the hard way. I think <laughs> Which now I have these seven do's and two don'ts of inevitable success. And one of them is 
just try to follow the simple instructions first. Just try. Right. Right. <laughs> if you have to go learn it the hard way, go learn it the hard way. But if you can follow the simple instructions. And it just felt like there are so many needs with my students. I still feel that way, right? Like there's so many needs. Nothing right. ever really stops, especially for everybody. But you do have to fill your own bucket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's especially people who are attracted into this kind of service uh, industry. It is it's hard for us to remember that, but it's such an important lesson. Um, marketing, how much time would you say you spend on marketing now? Or, or, or what was the most time you ever had to spend on marketing? Probably in the beginning, just getting that snowball of clients going. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of PTO reach outs, a lot of therapist reach outs. Um, I advertised at the school I was at. That was a huge one. Getting to know the guidance department, that was huge. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. just relationship building. And it wasn't so much like traditional yeah. you know, email blasts or anything. It was just slow and, burn, yeah. creating relationships. And just getting people to one, understand what it was and two, see the value mm -hmm. that it could really help a lot of students who mm -hmm. there weren't a lot of other options mm -hmm. for like getting over their hurdle, right? Mm -hmm. Like they were just kind of stuck, like tutoring didn't work, therapy didn't work. Mm -hmm. They just kind of needed a different angle to approach yeah. the problem. Yeah, and, and now I imagine you just don't spend any time on marketing. You, you, you've filled all that time with coaching at this point, the relationships just keep, keep people coming to you. Yeah. And I still like those most, um, profitable, like kind of relationships. Like I've kept those up because those people really became my friends. I right? was mm -hmm. like, Oh, like you're doing this. I'm doing that. Like they weren't, you know, superficial yeah. relationships. They really have stuck. And it's like, Oh, let's go out to lunch or let's do a yeah. zoom lunch or something. Right. Like it's, those have been really rewarding. I love hearing you say that. And just for anyone listening who's considering joining our program, we're actually, I'm weaving in a new networking curriculum from this person I really trust. It's called Networking That Pays, but it's literally all about that. How do we not just try and build referral relationships, but how do we find our kindred spirits so that it simply feels delightful to reach out and nurture our professional connections rather than a slog through lots of cold calling. Um, so I'm so glad that to hear from you that that's what you noticed because that's really what we're looking for. I mean, it's just, I'm just, I have very low tolerance for like not genuine interaction. So for me, that was the most rewarding too. I just, you know, when you first meet someone, you're never like, and then we're best friends, right? But, you know, and I have a lot of people that I did contact originally where it just kind of naturally ebbs and flows based on what they need. But like, I still really like them as people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 that's so great. Um, now I didn't send you this question ahead of time to consider and it's totally fine if you're not comfortable answering, but I am curious if you are willing to share even what what is the range that you've been able to earn um, in as a coach are you is there any version of that you're comfortable sharing i know this is public. yeah so <laughs> my packages in the beginning started at 1950 and then now they're up to 2800 for an hour a week mm -hmm. uh, for a semester yeah. uh, i know people have charged more than that or um, i've played with charging more i think if i were to continue in coaching i would up my rates again yeah but um I didn't during the pandemic. So it was kind of stagnant for a few years, whereas in a normal non-pandemic situation, I probably would have been like 3,200-ish, like probably by now. Yeah. But I just, everything was so crazy. I left it. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say in a full time, I keep my costs very low. Um, you know, I don't subscribe to a lot of services that I don't need, or I try to use the free trials to see if I need it. And I really try to do those in the summer <laughs> where I have time to do it and to dig into it versus during the school year. I would say my overhead costs, I just did my taxes. So for this year, my overhead costs landed about 6,000 
for insurance, tax, um, licensing. Um, you know, I subscribe to like lit charts or Google, mm -hmm. different Google like platforms for business stuff so I can get my email easier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's a pretty low cost business. And, and I probably could keep like what you pay me too, right? To be in, in the anti boring educators. Yeah. So that includes that as well. Yeah. So it's definitely, if you wanted, if you don't have a lot of capital to throw at it, other than the training, like you really can make it work. Yeah. Um, I think that's so great to hear. So, okay. Um, you are at this point leaving coaching altogether. You've had some health deals through the pandemic. Uh, and maybe there are some other reasons too. But can you share with us why at this point, seven years in, you've decided it's time to transition to a job job again? So I always wanted to kind of do a job job. <laughs> like it's really hard to do with little kids and a husband that travels a lot. Um, there were just a lot of constraints. I mentioned earlier, like it was too hard to move, to travel like into Boston. Yeah. Um, you know, that would have been a three hour commitment every day. <laughs> Um, when we were in England, I was commuting into London. So that was still a commitment, but it was a train slightly different mm -hmm. than driving. So it's, I, I always kind of had in the back of my mind, like maybe I'd want to go back as my kids got older. So next year I'll have two kids in college and then two kids in high school. Um, and really the timing worked out that somebody asked me, like, if I knew somebody who wanted a job and I was like, I'd be good at that job. And they're like, you would be good at that job. So <laughs> that is how this happened. It, it wasn't really wow. searching for it right now, um, <laughs> but it kind of fell into my lap and it's a really nice small company where I have a lot of autonomy and a lot of room for growth, like personally, and then to help them grow. So a lot of these skills that I've learned in coaching and running my own business. I'm like, okay, I know that one applies and that one applies and that one applies. Mm -hmm. And because we're a small company, their focus in marketing is really about building relationships. I'm like, I can do that. <laughs> like, are you in a marketing position? Yeah. So I'm doing sales marketing and then some like growth slash project management. Mm. I love that your experience as a small business owner has helped you then feel like you can step into a corporate marketing position. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of where I'm at. Um, I'm taking more classes to get certified in more official project management um, organizations, but that will be over the next few years just to build more stuff into what I'm doing right now. Yeah. I'm so excited for you to be able to make this transition. And in the meantime, so we're making this video April of 2022. And so you still have to finish the semester with your clients. Right. And you have 16 clients. You have to finish the semester. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you luckily are a member of our Anti Boring Educators Club. You are one of the licensed coaches. You have the circle of really high quality coaches that you can start creating, uh, setting your different clients up to move on with. Is, is that your plan? That is my plan. Um, I think some of them will be ready to kind of try it on their own, but I think, you know, for probably two thirds, they will really benefit from having mm -hmm. a coach and a different coach, right? Like, I do it my way. I think that's not always the one way to do it. And so I think having somebody else's perspective on how to get stuff done is really going to be helpful. I've noticed that too, after a client has been with me for three years, it's like, it's time for them to hear a new voice, even if we still have a good relationship. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so why do you think you stayed with me low those many years? If, if your marketing was going fine, if you could be fine on your own, why stay inside the club for as long as you did? I think I just see so many different types of problems that come across because it's not just school specific, right? It was like life and school. So there's so many different angles and tangents and things that can happen. And so I really found incredible value from hearing other people's experiences with coaching. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm seeing this, I'm like, oh, I'm seeing that too, but in a slightly different way. And I can tweak 
what everybody else is saying, like mm -hmm. from their advice and then like apply it. And it works so well. Um, you know, this student is having a problem with this particular subject or a teacher who is not quite explaining the way the student needs. Um, you know, how do we fill that gap? Um, there's just so many opportunities to learn and to get better at coaching mm -hmm. because there's just not, I, it would be hard for me to say like, you know, I think your training is amazing, but like, it's this continuing education that I found in the community that I mm. think made me a better coach and made me like faster at reacting. Cause I think I would have missed certain behaviors. Um, for example, one that really stands out it's come to us with a lot of different traumas that have gone to to the point where like they are looking for an academic coach i have found and sometimes their coping mechanism is to not necessarily give you all the information or to try to like not get in trouble by lying yes. um, you know there's a lot of reasons why kids like those are just a few but Mm -hmm. um, I found that that was very common mm -hmm. and the other coaches helped me see that a lot faster and how mm -hmm. to deal with it in a productive way instead of, you know, being angry or thinking it was about me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's just part of the process, right? Like they don't fully trust me, right? Like we haven't gone there yet. Like they're in bed. This is just a habit, right? Mm -hmm. um, or a lot of other ways. I know you've, you have more materials on like, why kids lie. And I just go <laughs> through that. And I'm like, okay, that one doesn't really apply. I'm going to test this one out. I'm going to test this one out. But I feel like that saved me a lot of grief. Like one, here's a very specific example. So I would often, when I started coaching, ask a student, have you done this? Have you done that? And that just set up an opportunity for them to right out of the gate. What I think they hoped they had done was yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I did it. Mm -hmm. Or and what then, they intended to do right after they intended the session, to do. So they might as well say yes to save time so you didn't talk about it. Right. Or like they didn't want to visit it again or a million reasons, right? Yeah, yeah. But that got me into a lot of trouble because I'd be like, they said they did it. So great. Um, whereas a coach mentioned, well, let's look. Oh, this was from last time. Let's just show me what you did or let's look at that. And I found that that really cut the line uh -huh. dramatically in half. Um, the show me, the let's. Like, let's just show me because then it wasn't any of this. Did you do it? Yes, I did it. Now can you show me? And then clearly they didn't do it. And then all those right. defenses went boop, 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 right up. Um, this is the part of the session where you show me what you've done. Right. Bam. This is show and tell, right? Like we always start with show and tell. Uh huh. Um, that's just what we do. Yeah. And you know, where are we at on the Quizlet? Let me see yeah. how far you've gone, right? Yeah. Like all these things. And I try to make it fun, but that was really all. Yeah. Getting good at that was from the community. It's sort of like setting boundaries on time. Like mm -hmm. somebody can tell you, don't mm -hmm. set up kids to kind of like tell you a story and then get proven right. wrong, but. Mm -hmm. The actual process of that, I needed more mm -hmm. iterations over myself, like, mm -hmm. and how to make it so they still trusted me, right? You know, like, oh, you didn't do it, and that's okay. Like, let's talk about why or how we're going to then blaming it. them. Oh, you shouldn't lie to me. Da, 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 da. So, getting some modeling from the rest of us about how to handle when these things happened. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that happened over and over, right? Like, yeah. that's just one example. Yeah. Of, where I found the community really helpful. Well, and a legacy that you are leaving to our community is that during COVID, you started the weekly short um, calls, collaboration calls between all the licensed coaches that um, I sometimes came to, but often didn't come to. So you all really are a resource for each other. And now those calls have continued on, even though you got too busy to even attend those calls over this last year. So thank you for your leadership in that capacity. No problem. I mean, the community is just so nice. I have to say like all the coaches who have gone through your training, they just all want to help solve problems, right? And mm -hmm. serve and mm -hmm. it's just a really nice group of people. 
Mm -hmm. I think that speaks to a lot of like you pre-interviewing people (laughs) before they sign up. It's true. It is effort on my part to meet with each person to make sure they're a good fit. (laughs) But it has its like that has its legacy too, because then you all can just really trust each other. And there's so much self-leadership there. Um, and I don't need to be there to make sure that personalities don't clash and that sort of thing. You all just support each other. Right. No, it's really nice. Yeah. Well, and it was such a interesting thing for, I always just thought people were staying in the community because they got referrals and that helped them make money. And so it was just really sobering for me to be like, wow, no, we really need each other. Coaches really need each other. And at that time, sometimes people come even when they don't have questions or difficult stories, just because it's just useful to hear people reflecting and also to be able to provide empathetic support to others. Because it is so individual. If you don't have a community, it can be very isolating as a coach, I have found um, yeah. that you're just kind of all on your own Mm -hmm. I think it makes me also very aware how isolating education feels for a lot of students that I have Uh like they do also feel like they're on their own so I'm often trying to like who's in your community who's on your team Um, because they've often been had the opposite kind Mm -hmm. of experience where they've been pushed out of teams Mm -hmm. you know pushed out of like different groups that could really help them or they've had bad experiences so it's like how do we rebuild that and I think having healthy isolation. Like we really need a team. We right. really do. We need a team to support us so that we can support our kiddos and their families in having their team as well. Right. Yeah. Well, we could talk on and on. I'm sure there are a million other questions that people listening are wishing I asked you about your business, but mostly I just want to so celebrate uh, what you've given to our community and what you've given to yourself and your family by creating this business for yourself. That sounds like it was a perfect fit in a specific phase of your life. And now you get to go on and kind of exercise your, these are the, these are the intellectual muscles that I've been really wanting to engage in for a while in a regular job, job in the presence of a a team and at a company that you really support. And I think really coaching, if, you have good boundaries, you can really do it long term. Mm-hmm. Um, it's getting that those boundaries set up. You're like, I could do this for another 10 years. Um, well, and you could come back to it if you right, decide right. at a different phase or like when you're ready to retire and you want a small term, you can always come back to it and generate. Now you know how to generate something from scratch. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, Jessica. Well, okay. take care. Don't be a stranger. Uh, we have each other's text messages. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. And those of you listening to the video, if you're thinking that you would like to dive in and find out more about joining our community and starting your own business, there will be, there will be links below on YouTube. So um, check those out and maybe I'll get to meet you soon. Bye.